thank you for coming. Uh, I'm especially proud we can, pr we can welcome Professor Christian Fuchs from the University of Westminster in London today. It's an event co-organized by the Media Sociology section of the Croatian Sociological Association and uh, uh, basically uh, supported by the Multimedia Institute and the Department of Sociology in Zadar. Uh, and I won't take up too much of your time. Uh, Christian Fuchs is a professor of social media at the University of Westminster. Uh, he is uh, a chair of the European Sociological Association's Network Research Network 18, uh, Media and Communication Research. He's a Vice Chair of the European Union's Cost Action, Dynamics of Virtual Work. Uh, and it's difficult to keep track of all of Christian's publications, but so I'll just mention a couple of latest uh, ones. Uh, Culture and Economy in the Age of Social Media, Digital Labor, of Karl, uh, Digital Labor and Karl Marx, uh, and he uh, also is the editor of the journal Triple C, uh, which is an open access journal. So without further ado, I'm presenting Christian Fuchs, who is going to give a talk about Raymond Williams, Herbert Marcuse, and Dallas Smite, so three critical theorists uh, in the age of social media. All right. Thank you, Pashku, for the nice uh, introduction. Thank you to the Multimedia Institute for uh, inviting me also, so I'm happy to be here and I want to talk about basically these two books that some are somehow connected. The one is called Digital Labor and Karl Marx, which is about Karl Marx and how to make use of him in the digital age. And this one is Culture and Economy in the Age of Social Media, which is sort of the second volume of it and you can also <coughs> circulate, we can, uh, we can have a look at it if you want to. Uh, and but somehow, I'm interested, I mean, it all goes back to Marx, my interest somehow, and to Hegel, yeah? So I think that's where contemporary critical theory really started, Marx and Hegel. But somehow in these two books uh, also, or in my whole, my evolution of my own, th of my own thought uh, and my own approach to critical theory, uh, also Marcuse, Smyth and Williams have been important at different stages somehow. So it all started with uh, Marcuse somehow, like 20 years ago, yeah? The others came later uh, somehow, uh, and it's also reflected in these books. And I want to discuss a little bit these three Marxist cultural the and media theorists today met today somehow. Yeah, and why I'm doing this and why I'm also engaging with Marx and so on uh, is because I'm convinced that these classical critical theorists, yeah, who are all dead now, yeah, can tell uh, can help us quite a lot uh, if we. Uh, appropriate their concepts and approaches uh, and further develop them yeah, uh, in order to understand uh, the internet in contemporary uh, capitalism. Yeah? That's somehow reflected in these two uh, books. So Raymond Williams, I mean, Raymond Williams, Marcuse and Taylor Smyth uh, roughly did the same kind uh, of uh, age group, yeah? uh, but they have different, well, backgrounds, where they are coming from, they have used different concepts. So Raymond Williams, for example, the idea of the whole way of life or the structure of feelings. Herbert Marcuse, ideas like technological rationality or one-dimensional consciousness. Uh, and Della Smythe, ideas like audience labor and audience uh, commodities. The interesting thing is there are hardly cross references between the three authors. Yeah? So it's more a theoretical task to set them uh, into a dialogue with a couple of exceptions, like one exception is Della Smythe's 1977 article, Communications, Blind Spot of Western Marxism, uh, a pro provoking title, which is still true today, I think. Yeah? When you look at a lot of Marxist theory, then communication and culture and media, the internet sometimes don't play a role at all there or are not taken serious uh, enough. But Smythe comments actually on a lot of other Marxist cultural theory and dismisses it and says they are all idealists yeah, that ignore issues of labor uh, and class and just when they discuss the media focus on ideology and he uh, says these are idealist theories of communications and he includes Marcuse among others, yeah, Adorno and so on, the whole Frankfurt School, also Raymond uh, Williams, so he dismisses them and says none of them uh, addresses uh, the, uh, the, the, the media in terms of labor. And he's interested 
to connect uh, commercial media that are advertising funded uh, to the idea of uh, labor. Yeah? So, but somehow he sets up also a binary between uh, labor on the one hand and ideology on the other hand, or between economy and culture, uh, you, uh, you, you could say. But I think this binary, this dual binary, does not hold true really, neither in the works of those whom he criticizes, nor in his uh, own work. So when he criticizes the Frankfurt School, then he says basically the Frankfurt School is just ideology critique, yeah, and is not uh, a broader political economy framework. But I think that's, that's wrong, because uh, you had some quite classical political economists within the Frankfurt School. So if you look, for example, at the, at the analysis of Friedrich Pollock, who was interested, wrote a book on automation, for example, yeah, he was interested in the impacts of technology on the broader political uh, economy, really. Yeah? Or in the 1920s, uh, part of the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research was Henrik Grossmann, who was more a, really an orthodox political economist, yeah, who wrote this book on the, uh, on the breakdown theory uh, of capitalism, and he expected that from the tendency of the profit rate to fall, capitalism would collapse. Uh, we know that he was wrong, but uh, that's unimportant for this, uh, per, uh, for this uh, perspective. It just shows that Frankfurt School is very rich and was really an interdisciplinary critical theory, as Horkheimer imagined it, and was not just ideology critique. Yeah? It was much more uh, than this. But also Smyth's work itself not just deals with labor <coughs> and commodities, it also deals with ideology yeah, itself. So you could say, when he says, those who deal with ideology uh, are idealists and not materialists enough, then you could say he criticizes himself somehow uh, also, uh, which then somehow disqualifies his own uh, critique, because he also formulated a role, he criticized the role of the media in, in, as its role in, uh, in capitalism uh, and that it promotes values that favor capitalism and the private property system, as he says in one uh, article, and that advances uh, assumptions like uh, all human beings are, e are egoistic, uh, uh, they cannot be otherwise, they can only argue, uh, they can only uh, behave in a selfish manner, uh, the possessive individualism in is inherent to human beings, and so on. So he makes also an ideology uh, critique uh, there. Let's start with Raymond Williams. Yeah? Uh, so what, is, what I find interesting in Raymond Williams for understanding contemporary communications uh, is especially uh, his book Marxism and Literature that he published in 1977 and everything that followed uh, then in the next nine years uh, until uh, his death. Of course, it's very rich, his work. Yeah? Uh, you know, like he defined culture as a whole way of life. He wrote these books, early books like The Long Revolution uh, or uh, culture and society, which are uh, uh, excellent analysis of like, well, literature in society, partly, yeah, uh, and beyond this, uh, he worked on a book about television uh, and so on. So there's a lot in it, but I think here in this book, uh, Marxism and Literature, uh, his work takes on a new dimension somehow, yeah, uh, the dimension of cultural materialism, he also explicitly calls it like this, and some people like Jim McQuiggan, uh, who just uh, edited a book of, uh, about, uh, about uh, Williams' works uh, and uh, also uh, republished uh, uh, Williams' 1983 uh, book Towards 2000 in a new uh, edition that was just uh, published. Uh, Jim McQuiggan argues this book should actually be called Marxism and Culture because literature is a minor part of it. Uh, it's much richer than uh, just engaging with uh, literature. But what, what Williams does in this book is that uh, he he questions the, the separation of economy and culture as such. Yeah? He discusses a lot of different approaches, yeah? uh, going back to Gramsci and a lot of, uh, of others, and says how in a lot of Marxist cultural theory, the relationship between culture and economy, or between base and superstructure, is conceptualized, is in such a way that they are, they are, they are assumed to be two spheres, somehow separate spheres, but that have a causal connection in some way. And then this causal connection is described, depending on an approach, as a, a relationship of determination, reflection, reproduction, mediation, homology, and so on. And he somehow <coughs> argues this is wrong, because no matter, even if they assume a causal relationship, they remain separate. So it's not a real dialectic then, yeah, where 
uh, two poles in a dialectic really encroach into each other and are identical and non-identical uh, at the same time. Yeah? So that there is an identity uh, of identity and non-identity of two uh, poles that are separate and identi identical uh, at the same uh, time. And he tries to do the same thing with the relationship of culture and economy. So he says we should not separate culture from material uh, social life and argues that a lot of Marxist cultural theory is not materialist uh, enough. Yeah? In contemporary approaches, there's a, a new book by Sum and Chesop, uh, well, I think it was published last year, uh, it's called Cultural Political uh, Economy. Yeah? And there they say that Williams was interesting because somehow this approach of cultural materialism, it almost sounds like Marx in the German ideology. But somehow they presuppose in this book yeah, that, uh, that Williams did not really read and interpret uh, Marx and the German ideology and other works. And that's wrong, yeah, because uh, Williams was a very thorough reader of Marx. He wrote articles, for example, like an article, Marx on Culture, where he goes to the uh, German ideology and other works and discusses sentence by sentence what Marx writes. And you know, he, he, such a thorough reader, he, he, was all, he interprets meanings and says, what does Marx tell us here? Yeah, what, Meanings, uh, what meanings could this sentence here be? So a very thorough reader, really, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Marx. And, and some and Chesop, uh, somehow, for them, cultural, political economy is something new, the political economy uh, of, cult uh, of culture. Because, you know, Bob Chesop is a regulation theorist, and a state theorist, and somehow, uh, now they have discovered culture, but what he, however, neglects somehow is that there's a whole tradition of the political economy of communication and the media going back to the early 1970s. Yeah? So it's a su even within Britain. Yeah? Uh, so it's a surprise that the British, British Marxists writing about the political economy of culture don't, are not aware of works uh, of people like Graham Murdoch and Peter Golding, yeah? which resulted in a very strange situation where I organized a panel on at the European Sociological Association Conference where Bob Chesop and Graham Murdoch were there. Graham Murdoch, political economist of communication, knew who Bob Chesop is, yeah, and so was saying, oh, great, I'm using his work, actually. Bob Chesop had never heard the name Graham Murdoch, which tells you something about the role of, uh, of communication and culture within the broader framework of, of Marxist theory. So sometimes it's simply dismissed or not engaged with. They're seen as superstructure uh, and, uh, and, and so on within Marxist theory uh, itself. But back to Williams, yeah, uh, he somehow he argues that this relationship of communication, uh, of communication and ideology, or of economy and culture uh, in uh, general, should be conceptualized uh, in such a way uh, that we uh, that we see uh, culture as being part and no part of the economy at the same time. So he somehow he completely reduces culture to the economy. And on the other hand, he says culture is also separate. So it's identical and non-identical uh, with the <coughs> economy at the same time. And this can only be done by a concept of work and labor. So what he wants to point out somehow is that, and, uh, is that uh, wherever there is culture, there must also be cultural producers. Yeah? And these cultural producers, cultural workers, they produce culture. Yeah? And this is an economic dimension. But at the same of, uh, of, of culture, but at the same time, and that's the economic dimension of culture. So wherever there is culture and communication, there are people producing culture and communication. But it, that's the identical moment of culture and economy. But at the same time, there are uh, culture is not reducible to the economy, but is also non-identical with it uh, because culture takes effect as, uh, as, uh, in processes of signification all over society, inside of the economy and outside of the, econo of the econo economy when we give meaning to things. Yeah? So culture is produced in the economy but takes effect all over uh, society. Yeah? So that's how he imagines cultural materialism. But, but why does this approach matter today? Why am I interested in this? I think there is a tendency in well, cultural and media theory today to separate uh, categories that inherently belong together like technology and content, the non-creative and the creative, production and circulation, productive and unproductive labor, labor and ideology, work and communication, uh, when, when analyzing phenomena uh, such as culture uh, and uh, information. An example would be peop uh, people who deal with cultural industries and cultural work, 
if you look at their definitions, then sometimes it's only artistic work that creates content that they include in their definition of what is part of the cultural industries or what is not part of it. So, for example, uh, they would say producing technologies yeah, uh, is not part of culture, really. For them, it's just uh, artistic content that is part of it. Yeah? Resulting, for example, then in claims that they say software engineers, they are engineers. It's not, and that's not creative. And therefore, it's not part of creative and cultural industries. Yeah? But I think that's a kind of strange claim, yeah? because it means that software engineering is not a creative process. Yeah? Uh, they, they say it's functional. Yeah? Mean, then implying software engineers are functional dupes somehow, yeah, devising algorithms that are just functional. But of course, if you talk to a software engineer, a lot of them will say a lot of it is a kind of software creativity. To devise an algorithm yeah, uh, is all, can also be a creative process. Yeah? So why, why to exclude software engineering uh, in the whole ICT sector uh, from uh, the, this term media and cultural uh, industries? And there are other uh, examples where you can find such separations, for example, in the debate, uh, this debate about uh, productive and unproductive labor uh, in relationship to advertised, funded, uh, social, so-called social media, where there's a big debate like what is productive and what is unproductive, and so on. Yeah? Uh, but how I now, how I, how I skip this maybe, uh, for me, the term <laughs> cultural work is important. Yeah? And it's a kind of reinterpretation of my own model of Williams. So I want to broaden out the notion of culture, really, yeah? uh, in, in, in Williams' sense. Uh, so and, and I think whenever we talk about culture, we need to look for, for cultural work also, which is important today because a lot of people, I guess even a lot of you in the room, uh, work in, in cultural industries. Yeah? They produce culture. and. Partly they want to earn a living with it. Yeah? And that's already in the end of the 70s, also Williams was arguing, well, this rise of an information economy is also one where people uh, work as cultural producers more and more. And this becomes economically significant, an economically very significant phenomenon. It's also a reason why we must see the connection between culture and work and culture uh, and economy. But what is cultural work then? For me, uh, the production of content and the production of technologies that we use for producing, diffusing, and consuming culture inherently belong together. So what this is a kind of stage model where you see down here what is physical work. Physical work is work, I would say, that produces physical goods that we can touch and feel. Yeah? When we uh, consume culture, and it's mediated in some sense, then we have cultural uh, technologies that, of course, must be produced uh, by what I would term physical cultural worker. They are those who produce, well, our tools of, uh, the, for the production, consumption, uh, and circulation of information, which by digitization all converges into uh, computing technologies and network computing uh, technologies. But based on, with, with the help of these technologies, you then have information workers who produce uh, information as a content. Yeah? But I think we cannot, in, 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 in the cultural economy we live in, we cannot separate these two things. Yeah? So, the, uh, so a, a lot of uh, content is uh, mediated and produced via the uh, technologies uh, and the other way uh, round. How you can think of this also is it's an example that Marx uses in the Grundrisse, uh, uses it in another way, uh, about uh, the piano maker and the piano uh, player. Uh, so in order to play the piano, you need a piano. Yeah? So you need, there must, be, there must be someone who has produced the piano, a piano maker. So the, piano, the process of Produ uh, producing the piano, that's what I would term the physical cultural work. Yeah? Then you have a composer uh, composing music uh, and you have someone playing the piano. Yeah? <coughs> the composer and the piano player can be the same person, but they do it a different kind of work. That's production uh, of, uh, of some form of information. Yeah? Music is an aesthetic uh, and effective form uh, of, uh, of inform inform information, but they do it based on the work uh, of the, uh, of the piano maker. So these two forms of work are interconnected uh, somehow. Uh, so now, Taylor Smythe. What uh, is interesting in Taylor Smythe? So he coined this notion of audience labor and the audience uh, commodity in his article from 1977. His basic argument, and it's sometimes misunderstood, is he wanted to exclusively understand advertising funded media. Yeah? 
no other media, because he was arguing these media, advertising funded media, are of particular importance today with the rise uh, of consumer culture uh, in uh, 20th century uh, capitalism. Yeah? And he was arguing, well, wherever there is a, and there is a commodity, yeah, then there must be, in Marxian terms, uh, abstract labor that produces this uh, commo uh, uh, commodity, uh, so that value is objectified in the commodity. If you now look at tele commercial television that is 100% advertising funded, then uh, the access to the content is not a commodity. Yeah? You get it as, he says you get it as a free lunch, yeah? uh, so that a lot of people watch. So the commodity must be something different. And he says what is actually sold is the attention of the audience to the advertising clients. And that's the, 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 the true exchange process taking place here. But if audience attention is a commodity, is his argument, then there must be abstract labor that produces uh, this commodity, this attention commodity. Therefore, he argues watching television, yeah, or commercial television, or listening to commercial radio uh, is a, a work process. And he calls this work process audience labor that produces an audience commodity. Now, he wrote this at a time uh, when there was a lot of uh, mass communication theory around because broadcasting was a big uh, phenomenon. Uh, today, of uh, one must also say that he, he somehow, uh, he, and he, and he, he saw the rise of advertising also, the importance of advertising culture, and he formulated this, this idea of audience commodity and audience labor explicitly against uh, Baran and Suisse's approach of monopoly capitalism, because in the monopoly capitalism school that is today also prominent among the monthly review people, uh, uh, like uh, John Bellamy Foster, Bob McChesney, uh, and others, their advertising and labor are somehow reduced to attributes of monopoly. Yeah? Uh, so uh, Smyth felt that uh, the idea of, uh, of labor is somehow plays, uh, a, plays a less important role uh, in this uh, approach. Uh, and he also felt that, that, uh, that, uh, that in the monopoly capitalism school and other Marxist approaches, advertising is reduced to an unproductive feature uh, of capitalism, whereas he wants to argue that commercial media companies exploit the audiences, yeah? which then means uh, almost like in a kind of parallel almost to autonomous Marxist approaches of the social worker and to, uh, uh, to like approaches like Marxist feminism that have stressed that housework and reproductive labor is also exploited productive uh, 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 work. He made a kind of argument in the media sector and he wanted to go away from the argue, from the orthodox argument that only wage labor can be productive labor and can be exploited labor because then a lot of labor that uh, that guarantees the existence of capitalism is excluded yeah like uh, uh, housework uh, and uh, so on and he says audience work is also such a form of uh, of uh, a kind of inner colony of capitalism that uh, is, is 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 created but is precarious because it's completely uh, completely unpaid helping capital to uh, increase uh, its profits. So that's just, uh, I mean, how Marx imagines the capital accumulation process. Uh, there is, in, in a single company, uh, so there is money that is uh, invested uh, into, uh, uh, into the uh, production process. Capitalists then uh, buy commodities, labor power, and means of production. Uh, that in the production process uh, are used together, labor power uses the means of production in order to produce a new commodity, C prime, that is sold on the market. If the realization process is successful, then uh, the, uh, the, the invested capital can be increased by profit. Part of it is paid as interest and so on, uh, and part of it is reinvested. The question now is this idea, can this help us to explain how Google and Facebook are uh, accumulating capital. Yeah? And here I think Smythe's idea uh, becomes interesting again uh, of uh, audience commodities and audience commodification. Of course, if you think of Facebook, uh, Google, Twitter, and so on, it's sometimes different than uh, watching television. Because what you can do on Facebook is you create social connections, you create content, you create data and met metadata uh, all uh, of the time. But we should not be mistaken. Uh, Google and Facebook are not communications companies. They are advertising companies. Yeah? They are the la world's largest uh, advertising agencies, which is not immediately apparent to you that they sell something, really, yeah? because, uh, because the, the trading of 
of, of data uh, is invisible. Yeah? But I think here this capital accumulation process becomes more complex because of, let's say our example is Google. Yeah? Uh, so Google invests, of course, also money. Yeah? We have venture capital uh, investors uh, and so on. Uh, they buy labor power, mainly software engineers uh, who, uh, who, de who develop uh, Google uh, applications yeah? uh, and so on. Uh, and they uh, have also uh, means uh, of production, yeah? uh, technologies, server infrastructures are very important. So uh, the inter these platforms have a very physical uh, infrastructure. And it's also clear, I mean, it's not, just, it's not just because they have powerful algorithms for analyzing, crawling the web. It's also that they need a lot of server space because they store all searches uh, and a lot of additional da uh, data from web uh, browsing forever on their servers and it's never deleted. And if you, can, you can imagine with, uh, with uh, billions of users really uh, who, use, uh, who browse a lot on the web, go a lot to Google and Google services, it's a huge amount of data. Yeah? And this explains also the rise of the idea of big data. But the point, so they produce a platform, yeah? Google platform, all these services. But the point here is, and it's parallel to Smythe's approach, uh, these services are not commodities because you don't pay for the access uh, to a Google or Facebook. Uh, it's, a, it's a free lunch, as uh, Smythe uh, is saying. But yeah, given that they are making profits, uh, the commodity must be something different. But in this case, it's not an audience commodity, but it's a data commodity. The data are sold to advertising clients uh, who are enabled to present targeted advertisements uh, on your uh, profiles. And at least in the case of Facebook and Google, this seems to work uh, in the, because they are profitable. Yeah? I think Google uh, makes like over 10 billion US dollars profits per year. Uh, and uh, Facebook, it's, uh, it's less, but it's also a very large uh, transnational company. But if the data is the commodity, then someone must produce the commodity. Who produces the commodity? Uh, the user who browses online, clicks on, uh, on, on, online on Google, Facebook, other commercial uh, uh, services, uploads uh, uh, data. Uh, data. So, uh, and then this idea of digital labor has emerged in basically in 2009. Yeah? In order, we wanted, uh, scholars wanted to, under, critical scholars to understand how does the political economy of Facebook and similar platforms work. The idea of digital labor was introduced in order to argue that when we are using these platforms, we create value, we create a data commodity, and are thereby exploited by social media uh, companies. Yeah? Meaning that uh, you are, I mean, it's a kind of an analogy, again, to autonomous Marxism then, and some people have, have used this approach then, that the social worker then also goes online, and when we go online and use these commercial platforms, then we also create value in our workers. Yeah? which is then an unusual idea of, of work, because then you are a, a mobile worker accessing these platforms from uh, anywhere. It's also in your leisure time. Yeah? So there's a kind of liquefaction of boundaries between, uh, uh, between uh, the home, the public, uh, and uh, the office, the, work, the, work, the workplace. The, work, the workplace becomes all ubiquit ubiquitous. Uh, it becomes uh, mobile, it becomes liquid, it becomes uh, flexible. Uh, and then uh, this digital labor produces this data commodity here that is then sold uh, as a commodity uh, to advertising uh, clients who pay uh, money uh, to Google and Facebook and so on. Part of it is reinvested uh, and so on. So you can see that actually this cycle that Marx introduced for, uh, for 19th century uh, industrial capitalism in my opinion, still holds true, but we must think about how uh, is commodification changing. Yeah? So the nice thing about Marx is, I think that his uh, that his analysis uh, on the on the on the on the on the one hand uh, is an abstract analysis uh, of capitalism. On the other hand, it allows us that it can be historicized and applied uh, to the concrete conditions uh, today. Yeah? Of course, Marx did not describe how Facebook works yeah, because it did not exist uh, back then. He did describe how uh, how, how the telegraph works, yeah, and globalization, uh, and so on. But I think we can draw on Marx's basic political uh, economy framework still uh, today. But now, if we, if we take this idea of digital labor, and it's digital labor when we go on uh, Facebook. Yeah? Remember that I was saying that, uh, that uh, when we go back to, uh, Ray, to Raymond Williams and also to, uh, to Dallas uh, Smythe, that what 
both want to remind us somehow is that we should see the materiality uh, of culture really. Yeah? Uh, and uh, basically what we do online is we create data. Data are not a material, but not physical really. We create content uh, and, uh, inform and information. But in order to access this information, we also need, well, a laptop, mobile phone, a server infrastructure, uh, and so on. And in the, when the term digital labor was introduced, the, uh, the, the production of technologies was somehow excluded from the term. It was all about digital labor on Facebook and so on. And what I tried to do in this book is somehow is to broaden out the idea of digital, uh, to digital uh, uh, labor in a kind of cultural materialist approach. So I think digital labor is more than this. Yeah? Digital, it's digital uh, labor or a specific form uh, of digital uh, labor when slaves in the Congo uh, mine, uh, extract minerals under slave-like conditions. You know, it's the, uh, the phenomenon of so-called conflict uh, materials that then partly are the physical foundation of our tools. Yeah? And that's a very different form of labor because slave, I mean, you could say wage labor is a form of slavery, but of course it's different from uh, classical forms uh, of, uh, of, uh, sl of slavery where the body and the mind of the uh, human being is the property of the slave owner, which is not the case in double free uh, wage, uh, wage labor. Yeah? There are 30 million slaves roughly uh, working within uh, global capitalism uh, and uh, the international division uh, of uh, labor. Then there are also these stories about Foxconn and the assemblage of these tools uh, in China under very harsh uh, tailorist working conditions. Military drill, working long, uh, out, long, uh, uh, long hours. So basically what is happening in China is a kind of primitive uh, accumulation uh, process, uh, really. And these workers in young rural migrants who work in these Foxconn factories, and you know some of the, the young ones aged between 16 and 20, have committed suicide a couple of, uh, ye of, uh, of years ago. Also, that's a form uh, of digital labor. Then you have what with Lenin and Engels you could call a digital labor aristocracy. Yeah? Think of people who work for Google, for example, yeah? in the Googleplex or in other people. The Googleplex, it also does not feel like labor yeah? because it's like a playground almost. It's a kind of play labor almost. At least it's, it's a test. It look, looks like this. Yeah? It looks like a playground, they have restaurants there, they have sports grounds. And the ideology behind this, the idea is also to keep people in the office, really, yeah? uh, in order to make them work longer hours and more hours. Yeah? And uh, on the right side, labor aristocracy is that they are rich in terms of wages. Software engineers working for Google or other similar companies have very, relatively very high wages, yeah? way above uh, average. Uh, wage uh, levels. But this richness in terms of wages comes along with a different form of poverty. It's a social poverty. Yeah? Uh, so the reason why I became a, uh, a Marxist media sociologist, you could say, is that I wanted to escape becoming a software engineer. I have a, 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 P, a PhD and a Master of Science degree in computer science and started working in the industry, really, yeah, in internships uh, and so on. And I found the working this, this, the conditions so alienating yeah, that I wanted to escape from it, really. I could not stay. And I was watching just, I was going, going to the back, uh, doing internships in the same kind of companies yeah, for like four or five years. I was going back, and the workforce was like quite flexible in the sense that nobody survived longer than two or three years there, really, because they were burnout syndrome. Yeah? So working in the software industry means sometimes working very long hours, yeah? uh, doing a lot of overtime because it's project-based uh, work. And so, uh, and and so on, which probably is true. I mean, these, these strange forms of, of working conditions probably is true that, uh, that, uh, that such things can be found in a lot of, uh, the, of forms of cultural work. So it's not necessarily only specific for software engineering. But then you, for example, find also software engineers in India. Uh, so the largest uh, uh, exporters of software are Ireland uh, and India. And why India? Yeah, because in India, the wage levels are way lower than uh, in the West, so a lot of, especially U.S. companies, because <laughs> European companies uh, outsource parts of, uh, of software engineer, uh, engineering uh, to India, because on average, an Indian software engineer has a wage that is only 10% uh, of uh, the wage level of a software engineer uh, in, the U in the United States, which then allows 
transnational uh, ICT companies uh, to increase and maximize their profits. Then there are these things like digital labor in the narrow sense, user labor and so on, but then whole forms of, of, of labor develop based on the internet uh, as a platform. I'm especially thinking of freelance uh, labor. So I don't know how it is in Croatia, but in, you know, I know the statistics for uh, the United Kingdom where I live. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the largest share of freelancers works uh, in the digital, uh, cultural uh, and uh, media uh, industries. Yeah? And a lot of these freelancers nowadays uh, use uh, these freelance uh, online platforms uh, such uh, as uh, Odesk, uh, Elance, uh, People Per Hour, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk and so on in order to try to find work. Yeah? So that's also a form of digital labor then. Digital labor in the sense of work that can only take place with the help of the internet. That's also a specific form. And of course then new problems come in because uh, the workforce on online freelancing platform, platforms uh, is global. The platforms are, are, are global. However, the regulation of wages uh, and working conditions is national or regional, yeah? uh, which creates problems like the effect that, uh, that on these platforms, the hourly, uh, hourly average wage tends to be fairly low yeah? uh, because there's a kind of uh, international competition between these uh, workers. And then what I'm arguing for is to see digital labor a bit like this. I call this an international division uh, of digital uh, labor, where you, you have Hegelian triangles here. Yeah? Uh, so in a Hegelian triangle, you have a subject and an object, and the subject object, which is a product. Uh, and for the work process, I think that's what Marx does in Capital Volume 1. He interprets somehow the Hegelian subject-object dialectic uh, in such a way that he says, there uh, is labor power as the subject, then there are objects which are resources and technologies and labor power uses these objects in order to produce a new uh, product. Yeah? So I think what happens in this international division of digital labor, so somehow these forms are somehow connected in such a way that first minerals are produced by miners. Yeah? It is, is, is more an extractive industry here, yeah? very physical work really. Yeah? Then these minerals go into the production of components, uh, which is uh, an industrial manufacturing process. Then these components become well uh, inputs here for another production process where technologies are, ass uh, are, are assembled, components are assembled into techno technologies. These technologies are then well put uh, to use uh, on this uh, level. Yeah? So this is the least physical kind of work. Yeah? It's more mental work really. But of course the I mean, physical producing information is, of course, always a dialectic of body and mind. Yeah? When I'm speaking now, I'm using my hands, I'm using my brain. My brain is a physical uh, system, yeah? but uh, my voice, uh, well, produces information that comes out of my brain. You cannot touch and feel uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, my voice, yeah? you can just uh, hear it. So, but, but there is a kind uh, of physicality uh, of, uh, of information work itself. So these are, but this only concerns the means of production. I don't know, you, you, could, uh, you could say that this is the level of the productive forces. But of course, for Marx, there's a dialectic of productive forces and class relations or, or social relations of production. And all these pro forms of production can be organized in the, fo in the form of different social relations. Yeah? And it uh, can be, for example, slavery uh, is a kind uh, of relation uh, of production as a specific a class relation, there can be wage labor, yeah, there can be unpaid forms uh, of uh, labor, there can be freelance uh, labor, patriarchy as a mode of production plays a role uh, because, for example, if you go back uh, to the Foxconn workers, they are predominantly uh, women. Yeah? Uh, so uh, patriarchy then interacts uh, with capitalism uh, and uh, so on. So we can find different modes of production, there are different class uh, rela uh, rel uh, relations. Herbert Marcuse. Uh, I'm interested in Marcuse since some time. And first, I started reading Marcuse when uh, I was a student still, but was, was starting to teach sociology and philosophy uh, of technology. And I did not find Habermas and Adorno and Horkheimer sufficient for engaging with technology. And I discovered, like, Marcuse really engaged quite good in some essays with the philosophy. Uh, of technology. And that's how I started reading uh, Marcuse via the philosophy of 
uh, technology somehow. But yeah, I come from the German speaking world where there's so much focus on Adorno, Horkheimer, and Habermas that sometimes Marcuse is neglected there. Yeah? Uh, but probably also because he was going to the US. Yeah? But then sometimes people say, ho ho, he wrote this book, One Dimensional Man which is just a copy of Horkheimer and Adorno's culture industry chapter in the dialectic of the Enlightenment, which I think is not true yeah, on the one hand, uh, but Marcuse wrote much more than this. And what was one of the books that most influenced my thinking uh, is Marcuse's book from 1941, Reason and Revolution, uh, which is an excellent study of Hegel, uh, where he wanted to introduce Hegel uh, to an English-speaking uh, philosophical uh, audience. So why I'm uh, interested in uh, Marcuse partly uh, is because of his concept uh, of the dialectic. Uh, because in, and in this book, yeah, somehow, uh, in, in dialectical philosophy you have more structural dialectical approaches and then you have more uh, subjective uh, or praxis and class struggle oriented uh, approaches uh, of uh, philosophy. So the uh, kind of objective dialectic looks uh, at uh, at capitalism as uh, con structural contradictions yeah? and identifies these contradictions and how they unfold in crisis uh, and so on. Whereas the philosophy of praxis, yeah? so for example, uh, Wolfgang Fritz Haug's philosophy that goes back to Gramsci and so on, for Haug, uh, the dialectic is always a, a dialectic in society uh, that is in enacted through social struggles. Yeah? But on the one hand, so you more have like structural Marxists and on the other hand more a more uh, class struggle oriented Marxists. Marcuse somehow was saying this belongs together somehow. The subjectic and the objective dialectic belong together in a meta dialectic where you have a dialectic of dialectics and the subjective dialectic and the objective dialectic stand in a dialectic uh, to uh, each other. So on the one hand in Reason and Revolution he stresses this objective dimension. Yeah? He says, Capitalism is a union of contradictions, these contradictions that Marx describes yeah, between use value uh, and uh, exchange, uh, uh, exchange value, between productive forces and relations of productions, and so on, which in the end result again and again in structural crisis. However, he says, it would be a mistake to assume that these conditions of crisis are either resulting historically in an automatic uh, uh, pro uh, progressive development or in a regressive development, because then he argues in these situations of crisis, it really depends, there is potential for change, but then it really depends uh, on, uh, on human social praxis, how the outcome of the crisis unfolds and what the outcome is, and may allow in a prolonged crisis uh, of world uh, capi uh, uh, capitalism, and it's not clear what the outcome will be. Yeah? Uh, it depends really uh, on the uh, social struggle. So Marcuse formulated in such a way that he says the negativity and its negation, the negation being these objective contradictions, uh, are two different phases uh, in the same kind uh, of historical uh, process. So when there are contradictions unfolding in a crisis, then the question is do people negate this negativity and in which way do they uh, do, they do it? Yeah? So he, meaning that the, the outcome of uh, of, uh, of social struggles is conditioned by, uh, by the contradictions that we find in society, uh, but it's not determined by them. Yeah? So every social struggle, uh, be it, I don't know, working class struggles, uh, or feminist struggles, or anti-racist struggles, anti-fascist struggles, are based on some form of social problems, on some contradictions. However, the outcome is not determined by these contradictions, but only by the political uh, praxis itself yeah, and how uh, it, uh, it, de it, uh, it develops under specific conditions. So, but yeah, dialectical philosophy, how can we use it in order to understand the political economy uh, of social media, what is now called social media? On the one hand, I think just very, in very general term, when we think of the internet, there is a kind of subject-object dialectic there because it's not enough that we have a technological infrastructure, which is a kind of uh, of technological structure, a global network of computer networks through which information can be transported. That's a kind of objective technological structure. But there's also a, a subjective uh, structure. Uh, it, uh, there are, uh, there are uh, networks of, of, of humans who engage in activities, yeah? sharing information, communicating with each other. And then there's a dialectic of these social networks and the technological uh, and, and, and uh, net, uh, net, uh, uh, networks going on there. I think now when you think of something like 
Facebook, Twitter, uh, and uh, so on. I think there's a, a strange dialectic uh, of the individual and the social in this, on these platforms, because what is, what is true is that uh, these platforms enable us to share information, to communicate uh, on, uh, online, to engage in online community. They are not the first platforms enabling this, there are older ones, but on the other hand, so you could say there's a kind of social use value. But on the other hand, there is a kind of instrumental logic and possessive individualistic logic that shapes the very design of these, uh, of these uh, platforms. So it's called Facebook because you are showing your face there. It's called, uh, uh, it's called YouTube and not our tube because it's single individuals uploading their creative uh, products, uh, pro uh, products there. So very kind of individualistic, also competitive uh, logic is built into the design of these platforms, which also serves uh, the advertising purposes uh, of these, uh, of these uh, platforms. The kind of underlying ideology is a kind of happy-go-lucky ideology. Yeah? You can only like things uh, on Facebook, you cannot dislike things. Yeah? You cannot say, uh, I, I'm, I'm sad about things, which then results in phenomena like this. I mean, yesterday was uh, the 70th anniversary of the end uh, of uh, the Second World War, of the liberation from the Nazi system, yeah? the liberation from Auschwitz. The Aus Auschwitz memorial page from Facebook looks like this, yeah? where they, I mean, uh, post like news like 50 years ago, like on this day 10,000 Jews were killed uh, and uh, so on. What people then do is that they like the page, yeah? You can just like it, yeah? Uh, because it tells us something about the affordances of Facebook, because what these people probably want to express uh, is not uh, that they like Auschwitz, really, yeah? but that they, they feel sad and that these things happen. Yeah? They find it horrible. Yeah? They want to express an anti-fascist uh, sentiment. Maybe if there are some Nazis among these 170 uh, people uh, who want to express yeah, that it's really great what happened, but majority probably just wants to say, I'm sad. But Facebook does not have the affordance uh, to uh, to express these emotions, yeah? and why it, it does not enable us to express negativity. It's a positivistic, or Marcuse would say, one-dimensional platform that only allows us to express something positive. You can only like Coca-Cola there, and Coca-Cola and McDonald's are the two pages, I think, with the most uh, followers uh, and likes. Uh, it, you cannot say, yeah, I hate McDonald's, yeah? uh, crap food, yeah? crap junk food, uh, Let's get rid of it. Yeah? It's not, not, on the, not on the McDonald's page. You can just like it. Yeah? So, and of course, Facebook likes this culture of liking uh, because it enables uh, it uh, in a more easier way to make uh, profits. Uh, so the question is also then, how does this, uh, will, uh, I mean, this touches on the issue of ideology somehow. Yeah? But where do these ideologies uh, come from? So uh, I just looked at how Facebook and YouTube Google and other platforms, how they present themselves. So why does Facebook uh, tell us we should use it? It says, well, Facebook enables, uh, has the power for you to share and make the world more open and connected. YouTube says uh, it's all about connecting, uh, informing, uh, and inspiring others across the globe. Twitter says uh, it's, uh, it's a free medium because it enables you to connect with people, express yourself, and discover what is happening. Weibo, the Chinese version uh, of uh, Twitter, uh, argues that uh, it's a platform that is designed to allow users uh, to uh, connect and sh share information anywhere. So taking all of this together, I think it's a positivist ideology that I would like to call the engaging, connecting, and sharing ideology. Yeah? So it's all about uh, the positive uh, dimensions uh, of social media, uh, of uh, that it enables these processes, engaging, connecting, uh, sharing. It's a little bit like advertising. Yeah? In ad advertising is product propaganda. Uh, it only tells you what is good about these commodities. It never says something negative. Yeah? So of course, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and so on, YouTube, they only want to foreground what is positive about these platforms. And here I think there's a true kernel to these ideologies. There is a social use value. However, these social use values are overdetermined by the value and exchange value uh, of these 
uh, platforms and engaging and foregrounding the social dimension of these platforms uh, somehow is an, ideo an, an ideolo uh, ideology distracts attention from issues like constant surveillance, the existence of a surveillance industrial complex that uh, is connected to these uh, platforms that Edward Snowden has un uh, uncovered. Uh, the, the, the idea, the, the, the fact that users are exploited and so on, which are much more negative uh, realities. Uh, how you can also analyze this uh, is with Marx's term of the commodity fetishism. I mean, the, and the commodity fetishism always turns up when we, uh, when we have to do with commercial uh, technologies. So just think of the iPhone, yeah? A specific form of commodity fetishism that concerns the iPhone is just in these advertisements. Yeah? Because what, I mean, the problem with the commodity is that you don't see the social relations behind the production of the commodities, yeah? which creates a vacuum that can be filled by ideologies like advertisements yeah? that create certain meanings for, uh, that are attached to the commodity. So the iPhone typically is marketed in such a way yeah, that uh, it's for the colorful people. Yeah? Uh, it's for the young urban hipsters uh, who uh, conceive themselves as being um, being modern, uh, progressive, uh, and uh, so on. So it appeals to certain lifestyles. Uh, uh, really, uh, the iPhone, which makes it probably such a success. However, commodity fetishism here means that the social relations behind produ the production of the iPhone, uh, the Foxconn workers, uh, and so on, who assemble these technologies and who say things like, uh, "I produce." Uh, 100 iPhones per day uh, it really looks like a great technology. Unfortunately, I will never own an iPhone yeah, because I don't. I will never be able to buy one because my salary uh, is uh, so low and it's just one US dollar per uh, hour or uh, or, le or less. So I will never be able to buy the iPhone. So these rela labor relations underlying the iPhone uh, become invisible uh, in the very uh, product. That's the classical form of commodity fetishism. However, I think when we uh, are dealing with these phenomena, yeah, uh, these ideologies here, uh, they, it's also commodity fetishism, but it takes on an inverted form that I term an ideology that is an inverted commodity fetishism. Because the thing is uh, about the iPhone, still in order to get the iPhone, uh, you must pay some money, yeah, or you you, you make a two-year contract and get the iPhone for free, but then you pay uh, 30 euros each month uh, to a telecommunications company. So you actually you see the money disappearing, yeah, but somehow with social media you don't see any money really, yeah. Uh, so it looks like uh, like like the, 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 the immediate appearance to you, yeah, is not the commodity in itself, and it also is also not money. The immediate appearance on social media are social relations. It's the social itself. Maybe that's why it's called social media, yeah? Because the sociality is apparent, yeah? Whereas the commodity form, yeah? The exploitation of digital labor, the class relations, uh, disappear behind the social form, behind the social use value. That's why it's so, so commodity fetishism gets inverted here, yeah? Uh, the, the social, appears to you, social, rela social relations, uh, whereas the commodity form disappears. Yeah? And this inverted form of commodity fetishism also makes it so difficult to make the argu an argument uh, like uh, users of social media are exploited and you should protest against Facebook uh, and so on. Because they see this positive side, the social side, yeah? whereas this exploitative side is not apparent to you. Yeah? So that's, it's hard to critique such uh, ideologies then uh, also. Uh, conclusion. I think what in general uh, capitalism and any form of domination is based on what, uh, what Marcuse called technological rationality uh, or Horkheimer uh, instrumental reason, all going back somehow to Lukács' uh, idea uh, of reification. And what gets reified uh, somehow in, in capitalism is on the one hand, uh, the human being's labor power becomes an instrument uh, for class power, uh, the, the, the power uh, and profits uh, of the capitalist class. And on the other hand, on the level of ideology, ideology is always an attempt to try to instrumentalize our consciousness. So it's a kind of duality uh, of instrumental, uh, of instrumental uh, reason. I think in the realm of capitalist media, uh, th uh, there are different forms of instrumentality. 
So when Smith and others talk about the critique uh, of advertising, then what consumer capitalism tries to do, it tries to make us to, uh, to into instruments uh, as consumers for the consumption of commodities and for the advancement of commodity uh, culture, yeah? so that our whole uh, life via commodity culture uh, is turned into like a huge kind of shopping mall. Yeah? And also the expectation on Facebook and social media in, in the online world is always that you click on these advertisements and that you then buy something. Yeah? The question is, do we click on this? And actually it's quite inefficient, this advertising. It only works for Google and Facebook. On Twitter, for example, it does not work at all. Yeah? Twitter does not make any profits, uh, really. Yeah, the targeted advertisements don't work. But I think what the scandal, the moral scandal really is, is already that we are always expected to buy something and always confronted uh, with advertisements. Yeah? So, so commodity logic via advertisements always enters our life. It's almost everywhere. It's not yet in our sleep, really. Yeah? Although, of course, Google also has the ideas that to wire our brains yeah? so that uh, you can, at some po future point in time, also uh, search via your brain activities on Google, if this would happen, then advertisements could directly reach into our brain even while we are uh, asleep. But uh, we, are not, uh, we are not there yet. and Hopefully we will never be uh, there. But that's one dimension. Then capitalism also means always some form of, of the commodity. And capitalist media can turn different uh, form things into a commodity. It can be content as a commodity. It can be audiences or users and their data as a commodity. Uh, it can be access uh, to uh, technologies uh, and platforms uh, uh, as a, a commodity. And it can be the technologies itself. Yeah? You pay for the iPhone and so on. However, wherever a commodity is produced, some form of, la of labor, the exploited labor, uh, must, be, must produce this commodity. So then there are different forms of digital uh, labor here. And then, of course, media are also systems for the capitalist media, systems for the diffusion of ideologies you know, uh, that try to instrumentalize uh, human uh, consciousness. Uh, and how this, as a summary, somehow, relates to these thinkers is that I think Raymond Williams, on the most general level, uh, wants to remind us, or we can say that this approach of cultural materialism reminds us that uh, culture uh, and ideology have an economy. Yeah? So it's cultural workers that produce culture and it's ideological workers that produce uh, ideologies. Meaning that in terms of, yeah, i come back to this. Uh, in Taylor Smith, uh, we can use this idea of audience labor uh, in order to understand digital uh, labor in terms uh, of the labor that produces the data that is then sold uh, as data commodities. But setting Smythe and Williams into a dialogue means that Williams would say to Smythe, yeah, we must criticize uh, advertising and advertising culture, but don't forget about the Foxconn workers uh, and don't forget uh, about uh, the, the Congolese slave workers. Yeah? They are all exploited by the same kind of system, yeah? the same kind of global uh, companies. So why they belong together conceptually, theoretically, is also because they belong together politically. Yeah? Uh, so uh, I, I, they, they can only overturn uh, the capitalist rule uh, of, uh, or, or can only overturn digital, cap digital capitalism if there uh, is a strike of all of them uh, together uh, and if, if there's systematic solidarity uh, between them. Uh, and then we can uh, take from Marcuse, uh, on the one hand, this idea with the dialectic, on the other hand, also the uh, idea of one dimensionality in ideology critiques. So, for example, the idea uh, that uh, that Facebook uh, is a, is a one-dimensional platform, a positivistic platform that uh, tries to uh, that tries to forestall the, di the dialectic, really, uh, the dialectic of activity of online uh, activities. Mm, I did I skip this now uh, over, but one can also go to Marcuse's idea uh, of uh, of how he interpreted Freud uh, and uh, with the idea of the performance principle, yeah in order to understand the category of play uh, labor, because a lot of this uh, online labor, uh, where we don't think it's labor, uh, is quite playful uh, 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 labor. Yeah? And this goes, can be connected in uh, psychoanalytical terms also to Freud. I had no time to go into this, but some chapter in one of these books uh, in, it, uh, uh, in, in it. 
So, and I think in terms of social media and from a labor perspective, there are different forms of, of, of uh, labor here. Yeah? There is this prosumer user labor, there are all these other forms of digital uh, labor that are its uh, material uh, and physical uh, found, uh, foundation. Uh, and then there are also these ideologies, the engaging, connecting, sharing ideology. And I think how we should analyze ideology, again based on Raymond Williams' idea that culture uh, is produced in specific work processes, meaning when there are ideologies, there must be ideological workers who produce these ideologies. And the problem is that uh, in ideology critiques, uh, th especially thinking of critical discourse analysis, ideology is sometimes only analyzed as a text. Yeah? So people do text analysis in order to critique and uncover how ideologies work, which is important. However, ideologies are also produced under certain working conditions by very concrete people who do this under very concrete conditions. Yeah? So we should also look at these conditions under which ideologies are produced. If you look, I, I, I looked into books by Norman Fairclough, you know, the critical discourse uh, anal anal analyst. They have like 500 pages. If you search for the word work or labor, I searched for the word, word labor, uh, I only found it twice but not uh, in, in, in terms of a discussion of uh, who produces ideologies as a worker, uh, but in terms of the ideology of new labor, the political party. Yeah? Uh, so somehow work is missing there. And also sometimes in labor studies and critical labor studies, sometimes ideology critique uh, is missing. Yeah? It's more an analysis of working conditions in different industries, which is of course, uh, in, of course uh, important. But of course, also as part of working conditions, there are ideologies in everyday work. Yeah? In companies, workers are confronted with ideologies by management, yeah? management uh, philosophies uh, and so on. Ideologies of typically in cultural work, ideologies of participatory uh, management that tell you well, we don't need hierarchies, we don't need uh, unions because we are all equal, yeah, uh, we can, if there is a problem, we can talk to each other because we are like friends really, yeah? we go and drink uh, a beer, there are no hierarchies, but actually there are hierarchies, yeah, which in the, in the non-unionized cultural and digital industries, workers only then realize sometimes when they are laid off. Yeah? And then sometimes it's too late, but in a lot of these industries it's very hard to, to form unions. Yeah? Uh, although I think it's important to form unions. Even for freelancers, it's important to have freelancer unions uh, in order to struggle for minimum uh, wages and uh, better uh, conditions, but traditional unions sometimes say, or not, it has changed now, yeah? so some unions now take freelance workers very serious, and there are attempts for forming freelance uh, unions, also independent freelance unions, but the classical trade union perspective was that freelancers are capitalists, yeah? we don't represent them, they don't earn a wage, yeah? which is like a, a wage labor centric uh, approach then, uh, really. So what I want to say with this is that also uh, within uh, the, the world of work, we are constantly confronted with ideologies. So there is the work of producing ideology, just like there is ideology in the workplace, and even labor is an ideology uh, sometimes. Yeah? Uh, who produces these social media ideologies? I mean, it's evident that Facebook, Google, their marketing PR departments produce it somehow. There's an interesting book that I really recommend by uh, B.J. Mendelssohn. The book is called Social media is bullshit. Uh, it's really it's the only good public relations book you need to read about the internet and social media. Yeah, because when you when you look for books about new phenomena like big data, social media, go on Amazon and search for it. The books that pop up first are books like 500 Tips How to Start Your Social Media Business, How to Make Advertising Successful uh, or Using Facebook, Twitter. Uh, and, and Google. So it's typically consultants writing books uh, about how you can uh, make a successful, uh, a successful uh, business. B.J. Mendelssohn was one of these consultants for like 10 years, worked uh, in the internet consultancy industry. His, uh, his, uh, in his book, his conclusion somehow is, he looks back, he says, what these consultants produce is bullshit. <laughs> so he wants to say it's, ide it's ideology, it's empty talk really, they just want to sell you uh, a new uh, management method or a new advertising technique that they have, a consulting technique that they have developed. And typically they argue, yeah, and you, when you go to, sometimes I go to marketing and advertising fairs just in order to observe how these consultants try 
to, uh, to present things. Typically, what they argue is technological development is so fast. Yeah? You companies or people working in public relations, advertising departments of companies, you don't get it. Yeah? You don't get how, uh, how fast technology is developing. Therefore, your, your workforce is under threat, your profits are under threat, you need to change things. Yeah? And I, consultant, have developed a new method of how you can be successful, how you can make successful public relations, how you can make successful advertisement, how you can sell your goods. Yeah? Uh, so in the end, it's a kind of marketing strategy. So B.J. Mendelssohn wants to say that those who produce this myth about the internet, including social media ideologies and others, they are, he says, they are, he calls them cyber hipsters, tech media and marketers, uh, analysts, uh, but also mainstream user media and partly users. So social media's ideological workers are tech company strategists, they are marketing gurus, uh, internet uh, consultants, they are neoliberal journalists who write tech columns that are, I mean, not the people like Evgeny Morozov, who is a critical, uh, really good uh, tech columnist and, and, uh, and uh, journalist, but people who write columns or, uh, or special or mega, uh, mega magazines that advertise the newest trends in, te uh, in, 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 uh, in, the, in, te in technology. So, for example, I terribly hate The Guardian's Tech Monthly uh, magazine. It's once a month because it exactly goes into this direction. Yeah? What are the newest trends in technology? Yeah? Which, which phone can I buy? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So it's kind of neoliberal uh, hype, uh, really. Yeah? Uh, and to a certain extent, there's also hegemony. Users tend to reproduce these ideologies to a, cer uh, to, uh, to a, to a certain uh, extent. But what I want to say is that there are actual production processes behind these uh, ideologies. It's concrete people producing these ideologies under concrete conditions. What William Smythe and Marcuse also have in common is a commitment to socialism. So Raymond Williams was saying that Throughout his whole life, he was convinced that it's necessary to supersede capitalism uh, so that a socialist society can be established. Yeah? Taylor Smythe was struggling for non-capitalist media in a North American context yeah? uh, because in, in Europe we have a history of public service broadcasting. Yeah? Uh, public service broadcasting, you can have your criticism of it, but normally it does not have a for-profit imperative. Yeah? In, uh, in, uh, in the United States, there was not an equivalent uh, to the BBC or other public service broadcasters. Yeah? So there was a struggle for establishing a public service broadcaster, and Dallas Smythe was engaged in this. And somehow then it turned out they, they introduced PBS. Yeah? But PBS is horribly underfunded, uh, really. There's not uh, a license fee and things like, uh, uh, like uh, this. But nonetheless, he was engaged in these political uh, struggles, which were for him also struggles uh, for, well, a, a piece of socialism uh, in the media landscape. And of course, Marcuse was part, of, I mean, was, part, was an activist himself, was part of the 68 student uh, movement and always was in, so, uh, so, uh, a philosoph uh, so philosophy and political praxis as belonging uh, together. Uh, and so socialism, well, is a struggle for determination uh, of the struggle for uh, existence, so that hard labor comes to an end and so on, where technology again plays uh, a role. Also, all three of them cared about the alternatives in terms of alternative media, alternatives to capitalist media. So Marcuse was talking a lot in the early 70s about the need to establish counter-institutions that challenged uh, the dominant uh, logics, and he saw an alternative media uh, landscape as part of these counter-institutions. Taylor Smythe wrote an interesting article in the early 70s called If the Bicycles What? where he is imagining a different way of how television could be organized or broadcasting. Uh, it goes a little bit back to Brecht's radio theory uh, or Walter Benjamin's idea uh, of the author as a producer that was then taken up by Hans Magnus Enzensberger uh, in uh, his uh, th theory or approach of alternative usages uh, of, the, of, of, of the media and how a socialist uh, media system could look like. So he speaks of a two-way system, a little bit like Brecht with the radio theory, where uh, every receiver can also become uh, a sender of, in, uh, of, in, uh, of, in, of information. I mean, you could be skeptical here and say, the internet is this, but still there are power structures uh, and class structures uh, on the internet. So it's not enough to establish these things technologically. We must also change the social relations 
uh, embedding these technological systems. And Raymond Williams in his television book, yeah, at the very end also, uh, has like a political vision uh, of a broadcasting system of a different kind, uh, an alternative media uh, system uh, that, uh, that uh, connects the media to the idea of participatory democracy. Yeah, so we all have this idea of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the alternatives uh, together. Raymond Williams was also pointing out a connection between, uh, just linguistically, between the commons, communication, community, and communism. So they all go back to the idea of making things common. So when you communicate, then you make things common. Uh, you share information uh, with others. And when you communicate with others, then uh, you typically don't have, uh, you communicate with your friends, you typically don't say, I only talk to you if you pay 10 pounds for every word that I, uh, that I say. Otherwise, I will not talk to you. It does not work in this, on this logic. So th this logic of, uh, of the commodity form is really alien to our communication processes. Because communication means making something common. So communication is part of the commons of society, like other commons in society, like communication, nature, welfare, healthcare, education, knowledge, arts and culture, food, housing, and other things that we all need in order to survive, yeah? really basic human survival uh, capacities. And basing the commons on the logic of markets somehow has damaging effects. Therefore, I think the idea that communications uh, and communication is based on the logic of the commodity and the market somehow always has some form of damaging uh, effect. And of course, what is happening nowadays is the commodification and privatization of all forms of commons, yeah? also welfare systems, education, higher education, healthcare systems, pension systems, uh, and so on. Uh, and the fact that also the communications commons are, t are taking on ever more the commodity form. I mean, this goes back to basically Horkheim and Adorno's idea of the culture industry, yeah? where the industry becomes, uh, uh, the culture becomes industrialized in the sense uh, of introducing the logic of the commodity. This is continuing un uh, up until now, this process, and Facebook, Google, and so on are just new uh, expressions of a long uh, historical uh, process uh, of commodification. The question is about, however then, are there alternatives? Can there be a commons-based uh, media uh, system uh, where we go beyond the logic uh, of the market, beyond uh, capi uh, capitalism? Yeah? And I think here we must ask questions about uh, two dimensions. Uh, on the one hand, civil society media, yeah? and it has to do with all the things you can uh, see here. Civil society that well produces alternative forms uh, of, uh, me uh, of media, uh, or alternative media and platforms that don't have a profit uh, imperative. Yeah? This comes outside of civil society. On the other hand, I think we have a history in Europe, and you have it in Croatia, it's in, in, we have it in the UK, or all over Europe, a history of public service broadcasting. Yeah? Pub I think from a critical perspective, one should not dismiss public service broadcasting with arguments like, oh, it's controlled by the state, it's corrupt, uh, and so on. This might be true in some cases if public service broadcasters don't have a strong form of independence. However, if they have this independence, then they are very strong mechanisms uh, for organizing the media. However, we have an idea of what public service broadcasting is. We have no idea of what a public service internet could be. However, we have a strong tradition in Europe of all sorts of public service institutions, public universities, public libraries, uh, public uh, broadcasting, and so on. I think for, for, for organizing uh, communications in an alternative way, an you know, alternative uh, to the capitalist uh, mode, we should also make use of this strong tradition uh, of uh, public service and public uh, institutions, just like the, the strong tradition of civil society. And the question is, how can they play uh, together? Uh, so now, like yesterday, 70 years ago, it was the end of the Second World War. It was the liberation uh, from uh, the Nazis. You can, what you see on the right hand uh, side here uh, is the capitulation document uh, that the German uh, Wehrmacht uh, signed. And you can also see a little bit here on the 8th uh, of May uh, 1945 uh, how newspapers were uh, reporting Nazis quit uh, war uh, and uh, so on. Of course, Nazism was coming to an end in 1945. However, this was not the, the end 
of far-right ideology, because especially in the situation of crisis and post-crisis that we are now in, there's a strong, I mean, I mean there's a strong uh, strengthening uh, of the far right, really. Yeah? I mean, even the country that I come from, uh, uh, Austria, we have the FPÖ, the Freedom Party, that has been very strong since the middle of the 1980s. Yeah? But all over Europe, you can see a very strong shift towards the right in the political spectrum, yeah? which also has to do partly with the weakness of the left, yeah? and partly also with the fact that so classical social democratic parties have become neoliberal and right wing parties. So sometimes you cannot really discern those parties that term themselves to be social democratic parties and those that are conservative parties. Sometimes they have really pretty much the same kind uh, of, uh, of uh, demands, which then makes it easy for the far right to come in uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and spread ideologies uh, and also uh, attract uh, voters by, uh, by, uh, by it and political interest. But how, if you think of three dimensions here, yeah? nature, the social, and communication, then I think the typical far-right ideology uh, is the following. Yeah? In terms of uh, nature, there's a kind of fetishization of national <coughs> identity and interests of family and conservative traditions. Uh, it's also anti-immigrant, yeah? uh, and uh, so there are the, uh, racist sentiments. In terms of the social, uh, typically there's a, a, a kind of combination of, of neoliberal uh, ideology that propagates the survival of the fittest and a strange form of socialism that is actually not socialist, that only propagates a kind of uh, welfare for the, uh, uh, for, for the national population that at the same time wants to get rid uh, of, uh, of, of immigrants and claims them for social uh, problems. In terms of communication and media policies, I think uh, this far right uh, is also it's a little bit schizophrenic. On the one hand, sometimes uh, it's quite uh, conservative techno pessimist, yeah, and sees traditional values under the threat uh, of the internet uh, and so on. So, a kind of conservative critique uh, uh, of, uh, of, of digital media and online media. On the other hand, it quite strongly favors <coughs> law and order and control politics, surveillance of the uh, of the of the internet, uh, and it comes also along with the kind of uh, of neoliberal ideology uh, that wants to uh, foster tech entrepreneurialism uh, and celebrates the corporate internet and the corporate internet uh, companies really as the future of economy uh, and uh, society. And uh, so these are three dimensions, nature, social, and communication, where the far right brings in instrumental logic. However, I think on all three dimensions, we can bring in the idea of the commons. Nature should be commons and our ecological commons Welfare should be common, uh, and uh, social dimensions, education, uh, healthcare, uh, and uh, so on, this should be a common, and the communications should be common. Yeah? I think how the far right can only be challenged is by a strong left, by a renewal of the left, you could even say by a renewal of social democracy somehow. Social democracy, understand more in, in Rosa Luxemburg's uh, sense, uh, of the struggle for democratic socialism, uh, and for, uh, a so for a socialist uh, democracy. And of course, you have, you have people, movements and parties struggling for the commons, yeah? like the green parties foreground the natural commons. Yeah? Uh, left-wing parties, uh, Syriza, uh, left-wing party in Germany, uh, Podemos and others, they struggle for the social commons. Yeah? Then there are people who struggle for the communication commons, but it's utter nonsense to have a pirate party that only struggles for internet politics and as the dominant uh, mode uh, of political, making political demands. Just like it's nonsense to predominantly focus on the struggle uh, of you know, on environmental struggles, yeah? because when the, when the right is so strong, yeah, then we must see the connection of the struggles for the natural commons, the social commons, and the communication commons. Yeah? This is also why I think that when we are discussing these media issues, these issues with communication comments and how we can have an alternative media landscape, we must see it in, a, in, in, the, in the framework of broader struggles, broader struggles for the end of neoliberalism and broader struggles uh, also uh, for the end uh, of uh, capitalism and for a different form uh, of uh, communism in the end, yeah, a kind of, uh, of communism that 
strengthens the commons in society. Uh, so I think what we need in the end, really, to have an alternative internet uh, is also a, a struggle for a framework, uh, well, that we can best term communism and digital communism, but which also then means that uh, we need another communism, and that uh, another communism uh, somehow should be possible uh, today. Thank you.